So my German is not that good. Was he saying nice things about me? Yeah. yeah. yeah? Okay, good. Just, just checking. Mm. Okay, very good. So today is a very special day for several reasons. First of all, I was able to get all of this working within five minutes. That rarely happens. <laughs> I'm very proud of myself. Um, and uh, the second thing that uh, is special today is I met uh, Nicole Rauch. Where is Nicole? Is Nicole still here? Over there! Hello, Nicole. So Nicole was one of the participants who attended the very, very first Management 3.0 workshop that was seven and a half years ago in January 2011 when I was still testing it. So thank you, Nicole, for being there. Much appreciated. Um, and she gave me good feedback and the others as well. And since then, so many things happened. My God, there are a few thousand workshops by now. There are 260 facilitators in the world. And I'm not even doing workshops myself anymore because I, I do other stuff like writing books, for example. Um, and the last book that I wrote was Managing for Happiness. And what is also special is that there's now a German edition of it. Woohoo! I'm so happy. <laughs> that's Managing My Happiness. <laughs> Uh, so uh, that has just become available a couple of a couple of weeks ago. Still looking forward to the for the copy publisher. Where are you? Oh, hint, hint, hint. Um, and uh, another thing that's special is uh, I'm I'm sort of switching to a new topic. I will tell you a little bit about that at the end of the at the end of this talk. So I'm sort of wrapping this up, wrapping up the managing for happiness. So I, I, want, I want to sort of reflect on the last uh, two years. So I will go through the presentation but also do a bit of reflection with you uh, of, these, uh, of these topics. And uh, it starts with the usual observation that uh, I am not a manager, uh, sorry, I'm not a software developer. I saw lots of technical topics here at this, at this event. Uh, I know what they mean because I was a software engineer indeed. I studied at study at the University in Delft in the Netherlands. I was raised as a software engineer, but I was probably so bad at programming that my teammates begged me to become a manager and get away out of the team. They were quite successful at convincing the CEO to get me out of there. Um, so I started managing organizations. I was, I was pretty bad. I was not very good at, at managing stuff. For me, for me, Software developers were computers on legs with hair. Right? <laughs> that's, that's, how I, that's how I managed them. I gave them instructions. They never followed them. They never followed them. My computers were much more reliable than my software developers, I, I noticed. I tried debugging on software developers. Doesn't work, I can say that. Does not work. So I had to learn how to work with people rather than, rather than computers. That was a completely new experience uh, for me. And that is the same with lots of other managers around the world. They treat the organization as a machine, as if you can program everyone and give them roles and instructions, and then they don't follow them. Big surprise, <laughs> because they're people, not computers. Um, there's a strange sound going on, so maybe someone for the sound can do something about that. Um, so I was, I was pretty bad at management stuff and, and bad management leads to bad uh, performance. That's, that's what I noticed. Uh, I, was, uh, I was not that good. But things have changed. Now I travel around the world. I'm now in Karlsruhe, which is awesome. I will be in Paris next, uh, next week, which is awesome. I was in London last week. So I get around, I talk with lots of people and they want to hear about my stories of how I uh, improved as a manager in, in software companies. And there's no one silver bullet for better management in, in a software company. There's no, there's no holy grail, as the British would say. But who cares what the British think nowadays in, in Europe? <laughs> <laughs> we don't. <laughs> but uh, I noticed there are seven silver bullets. Uh, there are seven, seven things that I noticed in the last uh, 10, 15 years since I started uh, managing. And I will give you some examples with some storytelling. So I noticed that it is easier to influence people to change their minds and to get them to follow instructions by using food. <laughs> it, researchers know that when you want to influence someone, stuff food in their mouths. 
<laughs> that is a very successful tactic. I live in Brussels. We do that all the time in Brussels at the European Union. I know all of that because my spouse works for the European Union. And so they, they have lunches and dinners all the time. Everyone's trying to influence each other. So I once thought, so, oh, what, that, that, that's interesting. How, what, what can I do there as a manager using food with my, uh, with my employees? Uh, and I thought, so let's, let's have dinner. I organized uh, random employees to my house. Two software developers, an account manager, project manager, a system administrator, uh, the senior vice president of the kitchen utensils. And when they got to my house, uh, when they arrived, I told them, and now you do the cooking. Surprise! <laughs> they thought it was a little bit weird <laughs> that they had to do the cooking. But then they started cooking. This is an actual picture that we took uh, back then. And I had the recipes ready. And uh, they themselves decided who would be doing what. The software developer and the project manager said, OK, I'll, we will do the main dish. And then the other software developer and the account manager said, OK, we do the appetizers. And the system administrator said, OK, then I will take care of the desserts. And being a system administrator, he did not allow anyone access to the chocolate, of course. <laughs> without asking for permission and filling out a form. So, um, so that, that, was, that was fun. And I was managing, which meant that I was doing nothing and just watching what was going on. And I poured some drinks. That was a very good role, I think. It was a good leadership role, pouring the drinks, making sure that everyone was, uh, was, was happy. And I, I call that managing the system and not the people. I did not give instructions individually. They gave each other instructions. No, you don't cut the garlic like that. You do it like that. They, they helped each other out. But they made sure that there was an environment for them to be successful in. And I, I have started calling that management 3.0 uh, as, as a new way of, of dealing with, with, uh, with people's systems. There we go again. This is rather annoying. I hope somebody can do something about it. Oh, there he is running. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Run, run, run. Solve it. Thank you. <laughs> awesome. So, so um, the, um, uh, what, what I also did was nurturing the happiness in the, uh, uh, in the, in the system. So making sure that everyone has uh, had a great time. I, uh, I once talked with my CEO back then, I was CIO at the company where I worked, and I said, we never celebrate anything around here. We're always rushing from one project to the other, busy, 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 busy. Every now and then we should, we should just stand still and enjoy what we have achieved. He said, okay, what do you suggest? I said, well, uh, maybe something that makes a bit of noise, like a bell that we can ring to celebrate. I said, so that's a good idea. I forgot about it, and then two weeks later, he came to my desk with this copper ship's bell. It was an actual bell. I have no idea where he stole it, or which ship has sunk since then. <laughs> but anyway, it was a real bell. I was like, whoa, awesome. I brought it to the office police, the office manager, I mean, of course. And um, she placed it next to the coffee machine, and from that moment, anyone was allowed to ring the bell for any reason. Didn't matter what. It could be a new project delivered. It could be a new baby delivered, usually by an employee, not by the company. We didn't do that. Um, but it was, anything was allowed. And then the bell made a huge fucking noise, I can tell you. It was a big open office space that we had in, in the company. So you could not ignore it. And then 150 people would drop their work and go to the coffee machine to learn what the celebration was all about. It helped that everyone uh, uh, knew that there probably would be cookies and cake. So run before it's all gone. Yeah. And then the person who rang the bell would say, well, this is what we celebrate. And everyone, yay, applause, cookies, cake, and everyone gone. It took 10 minutes. Big success. Funny thing is that the last time that I heard the bell was when the CEO announced to the whole company that I had just quit my job. You know? <laughs> True story. So I was there again a couple of years ago, and the bell was still there. And I was so proud of that, because it was my idea. And I added it to the company's rituals, and it became part of the culture. We celebrate things, random stuff that we think is worth celebrating with cookies. So that is adding a dash of playfulness to the culture, right? Uh, that I was responsible for. But it was also an experiment, like a management experiment that I ran. 
can I do something about the culture here and, and add a new, a new ritual? Well, it turned out that I could. And I noticed as a manager that I had to do more of these experiments. You see what works and what doesn't. Many things work, many things don't, but that is the whole point. You don't know until you try as a, as a manager and leader. Another thing that I have tried successfully over the last couple of years is, is working, without, um, uh, working without contracts with the people that I, uh, that I work with. Because I thought contracts often limit people's freedoms. You cannot do this, you have to do that, and it is so annoying. So I have uh, two teams now, both uh, small companies, and they have no contracts with anyone. It's all based on trust. For three years already, it works wonderfully well. This is how they feel about that. <laughs> they seem pretty happy to me. There's no contract saying this is your role name and this is where you need to work and this is your start time and end time. No, they decide for themselves. If anyone wants to work from Bali as suddenly like Hanu does once per year, okay, fine, then he works from Bali, we'll somehow make it work. Uh, and one of my other team members now is in Russia for the World Cup. Okay, fine. He tries to do his work in between all the football matches. We'll figure out how to, how to work together as a team. They love that, that freedom. And uh, I do that because I want to innovate in the way I manage, I manage companies and have people enjoy their freedoms. Um, and it's also, it allows me to focus on the meaning of the company. What is it, what is the purpose for us? The purpose is not start at nine o'clock and end at, at five. That, that may, means nothing to me. We want to make the world a better place somehow with a product or a service that we offer. That is what we want to focus on. So those are the seven bullets, seven silver bullets. Let's review them one, uh, one by one again. It starts with building for meaning. There are other speakers much more famous than I am, like Simon Sinek. He wrote a whole book about it starts with why. Good, good book. Uh, same, uh, same point he is, he is making. And then uh, you have to innovate as a manager. I do that all the time. Agile and lean in the agile world, in the software world is, is good, but it's not enough. We also have to change the way management happens and leadership in, in companies. And that means learn faster. Uh, uh, run more experiments as, uh, as a manager and a leader. Try things and add a dash of playfulness every now and then. I'll have you some more examples of, uh, of that in a moment. And nurture the happiness in the system, pour them a drink every now and then, that will make them happy. Uh, ultimately, you're managing the system and not the people. That is what I had to learn as a former software engineer, that I was not giving people instructions, but I prepared the environment for them so they could give instructions to each other, which was much more useful. So these are the seven silver bullets. Are there any uh, uh, managers, team leaders, development managers in the room? Anyone with a, with a leadership uh, role? Oh, a couple of people. All right, okay, cool. So for the manager in the room, I have a special version of this slide that makes it easier to understand. Um, it has the same information, but devoid of any color. <laughs> And then with seven bullet points, <laughs> which is uh, much more impactful with management, as I noticed. <laughs> so uh, always adapt to your audience. Always, always adapt to your audience. And then, of course, with something going up, which is crucial to have on management slides, you have to have a graph with something going up. Doesn't matter what, as long as, <laughs> as, long as it goes up. Right? So, uh, so those are seven silver bullets, and I will give you a number of examples, other things that I have done with my teams, and I will reflect a little bit on it uh, on, on the way as, as well. So uh, I work with remote teams. I love working with remote teams. I, I, I have no office, basically, other than my own home. And uh, that also that has its benefits, but also challenges, of course. How do you feel like you're one team together? Well, that means you have to put more effort in getting to know each other. It is easier to have a conversation near the coffee machine when you're co-located. But when you're not, you have to be deliberate in your practices. So one thing I came up with uh, is, is a practice called personal maps. I thought we use mind mapping to dive into topics and learn about that. Well, what if that topic is a team member? 
What if I want to know a little bit more about my team members? Why not start personal mapping, mind mapping ourselves? So this is me, my mind map uh, starts in the middle with my name. Notice the absence of an umlaut here, very, very important. <laughs> I consider the Dutch even more efficient than the Germans. We don't need that stupid umlaut thing, okay? <laughs> Just waste of ink. Um, and, uh, and then I fill the page with whatever comes to mind, like, like family, hobbies, education, etc. And then I ask the same of my team members. So uh, this is the personal map of Lizette. She is the remote office manager of our Happy Melly team. And she adapted the practice because she used pictures. What an innovative idea. I didn't come up with that. She adapted the idea already. And uh, that's cool. And then uh, one thing we came up in this, in, uh, with this practice, with this exercise, is that it, it is boring when people explain their personal maps. Because then the extroverts go on and on and on and on and on, and it never ends, basically. And the introverts, which is nearly all the software developers, they are done in 10 seconds. Right? And that's not fair, okay? So you level the playing field by just showing the map and then other people start asking questions. No presenting, just answering questions. So we had questions. Hey Lisette, why did you have pink hair over here? And Lisette said, oh, I was 19 years old and I was experimenting with hairstyles. And you know how it is when you're young. And then we had a great discussion about the silly things that we did when we were young or when we were feeling young. So, uh, good conversation starter. Here's another one. This one is by Hanu. Hanu is from Finland, which is totally obvious, as you can see, because there's almost nothing on the personal map. <laughs> My friends in Finland pride themselves on the fact that they use very few words in their communication. They have to, because in Finnish, the words are five times longer than in any other language. <laughs> so they have to be very economical in the way they speak. My name is Hanu. I'm from Finland. <laughs> Let the questions begin. <laughs> All right, okay, Hanu, where in Finland? Helsinki. <laughs> it took a bit of uh, effort to get uh, Hanu to talk. Uh, but Hanu was awesome. He's a web designer. He's been on the team for, for more than three years already. And uh, I love it because the, the personal map already explained with the way people make them, it's, it says something about who they are. And, and this is, by the way, this is typical for Finnish design, right? Because Finnish design is, there's no need to fill empty space with crap. <laughs> As anyone knows who has Finnish uh, uh, interior decoration. So, uh, this one is by Sergei, our software architect, as you can see. <laughs> I love these personal maps. <laughs> it's such a great invention. And uh, I have others by Dave and Terry and, and Nicole. These are from workshops that I, that I did. And uh, Julio, engineering manager, of course. <laughs> and what I like is that this is still a practice on our teams. When we onboard a new person after recruitment, the first thing we say is we'll schedule a call and we're going to discuss your personal map. Here are ours, so you can have a look at how we did that, and then we're going to ask you questions about family, friends, hobbies, purpose in life, and whatever. Make sure you have your map ready. And people love that. It's a great way of getting to know remote team members. Other example. You have to delegate work. You have to, to, to trust that the team gets work done. But mm, that's a scary thing sometimes. And many managers are not so good at that. They're not so good at that. And uh, that, uh, that's all about, about uh, management delegation. Did you know, by the way, that the word management is from the Italian word maneggiare? It means handling or leading horses. Isn't that nice? <laughs> it's not dealing with a machine. It's dealing with something that is alive, that you have to nurture and feed, and, and, and hopefully it doesn't kick you in the face. Right? <laughs> it's like real management. <laughs> 
So uh, I like that, working with a living organism. That is what management originally is, is about. I love that metaphor. And sometimes I am at agile conferences and scrum gatherings and, and I get the idea that from, from coaches and consultants that, that, they, that, that they want the whole organization to be self-managed and, and they say, we don't need managers around here. Let's put the managers on the list of impediments. The, <laughs> the scrum master will deal with them. And I'm like, hmm, careful there. Because <laughs> if you, to use the metaphor, a, a, a fully self-organizing, unconstrained horse, that would be a wild horse, okay? So I don't know about you, but I'm not going to sit on a wild horse and slap its ass and say, yoo and then hope that it runs in the right direction. <laughs> what kind of management is that? No, I, I have a certain idea for that horse, for the organization. I wanted to win a race or, or whatever. So this metaphor is, is pretty useful. And as I said, uh, that, that, that is about delegation, about boundaries, and many managers are not so good at that. Either they, are, either they are dictators on this side and giving everyone instructions, or they are anarchists on that side, and basically they let things go and then you get chaos. But often the best decisions are somewhere in the middle. So what I did was I simply created uh, seven cards or seven levels, delegation levels, to clarify the language, makes it easier to explain what we mean. Like level one is pure dictatorship, tell, Trump style basically, right? <laughs> it's giving people instructions. Level two is uh, sell, you can try to convince people but still your opinion counts as the leader. You say, well this is what's going to happen but I will listen to your concerns. Level three is consult. You ask people, what do you want? What do you want? What do you want? You gather all the input, you mix it together, and then you make a decision based on the, on the suggestions from the, from the employees or the team members. Level four is agreement, consensus, uh, democratic decision-making between the leader and the team. I call it the typical Dutch approach. We talk and talk and talk and talk endlessly until most people died of exhaustion. And then the, the survivor makes the decision, basically. <laughs> um, and then level five is advice. That is consultancy style, servant leadership. You suggest to the team, ah, if I were you, I would make that decision. But you decide. You decide. <laughs> but if uh, I really think you should be doing that, but you can do, decide if you... <laughs> but you would be an idiot if you don't do that. But uh, okay. So clearly nudging them, right? But they can say, no, no, we'll do it our way. Level six is inquire. I don't even nudge them, but I, I express my interest. So what did you do? Keep me informed. Let me know what happened, because I feel uh, uh, concerned and interested in the outcomes. And level seven is full delegation, anarchy. You know better. That's the wild horse. Uh, you do whatever you want. I trust you to make uh, smart decisions. And you can put that horizontally uh, uh, on, a, on, a, on, a, on a grid uh, and uh, I, that's what I like about these seven delegation levels. You can visualize them and clarify the language. So for example, uh, level three is applied to vacation days. That means that uh, the manager decides but you can offer your suggestion. Like, hey, can I go on vacation from July 17th to August 2? And the manager says, hmm, let me think about that for three weeks. Hmm. <laughs> Okay, for this time, or for this time, let's go. Let's, um, and um, team membership is level five. That means the teams decide who is on which team, but with suggestions from the, from the leader, from the team manager. So I suggest that maybe that person could be better over there, but you decide. Clarity, that is often what is, what is missing. Right? The horse does not know where the fence is in many organizations. The horse feels much better knowing that there's a fence, hopefully far away with a lot of space, but there is a fence somewhere. There are boundaries. And uh, I have some pictures of, of companies actually applying delegation uh, levels that with delegation boards. This one is from, uh, from a company in Bulgaria, which is interesting because it is actually a Dutch company and you would be able to see that because of, uh, of small details on this, uh, on this uh, grid. Are there, any, are there any Dutch people in the room, by the way? Anyone with Dutch heritage? No? Okay, I'm going to give away the biggest secret of Dutch people. Okay, don't tell anyone. Okay. So, Dutch people have this, this 
difficulty of dealing with order and freedom at the same time. Yeah? We love our freedom, but we don't want things to get out of hand. We don't like that. We don't like chaos, but we love our freedom. Yeah. So, for, for example, has anyone ever flown into Amsterdam Schiphol Airport? I'm sure many of you have. Yeah. So, uh, did you see, did you have a look out the windows before landing and did you see how nice and straight all the fields are in the Netherlands? Yeah. Very rectangular, very square -y, right? As if Mondrian himself painted the Dutch landscape. Yeah. Only green instead of red, yellow, blue. Now, most of what you see down there is probably marijuana, right? <laughs> but we Dutch, we don't care what you grow as long as it is in a straight line. That's important. <laughs> It has to be in a straight line. All the trees are in a line. If they're not in line, we cut them off. Right? They have to be in line. And we see something similar here. Uh, there is this uh, seating arrangement. So interesting. Level one, tell. You sit there. You sit there. You sit there. Maybe a little name plates for everyone, right? That's a seating arrangement. At the same time, salaries are delegated all the way to level six. You pay yourself anything you want. I don't care. But sit in the right chair, for, for God's sake. You cannot pay yourself a salary from the wrong chair. That would be, that would be chaos. The Dutch brain cannot handle that. So... Uh, this one is from Poland, where they invented the new level zero. That probably means I'm not even going to tell them what I decided. Huh? <laughs> Screw them. This one is from Germany. Complicated. <laughs> Complicated. Whole company was involved, all 7,000 people for one, for one delegation board. But they had it nailed down after several weeks, I think. Um, and uh, this one is for my, my, my Happy Melly team. And so this, this is clarity, clarity for people. That's what they need. There's a nice little game called Delegation Poker that you can, that you can try. It is a silly game, basically. It is, it is the horse and the rider uh, guessing together where the fence is. Makes no sense. It makes no sense whatsoever, but people love the game, so we keep, we keep giving it away. And it, 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 makes, it makes the boundaries discussable, and that's, of course, the whole point of this, uh, of this exercise. Another thing that I have been working on, and there's a bit of reflection here, because I'm still struggling with this one. This is about metrics. How do you measure that the team is making progress? Because now we have a motivated uh, team, they, are, they know each other a bit better, they, they can self-organize, make decisions within boundaries. Now I want them to see making progress. Uh, I want to see them moving in the right direction. How? Well, the most popular practice nowadays for, for, for seeing what happens uh, together as an organization is called OKRs, Objectives and Key Results. You've probably uh, heard of it. Uh, maybe there was a session about it. I, I have no idea. I'll tell you a bit of my, my experience. I'm still struggling there. I love the idea, but I'm still struggling with the implementation. But my I'll show you my first attempt. So for the ones who don't know what OKRs are, the O stands for objective. The objective, something that you want to achieve. Like the first time my book came out, Managing for Happiness, it was actually called Workout in its first edition and was self-published. I had never self-published a full-color book before in print. So, of course, my objective was to increase sales. That was the first quarter of 2015. That's the objective. Sell more. Duh. Uh, and then you may have to make that measurable. That's what the KR is for, the key results. They're basically the targets you give yourself. So I gave myself targets. I said, okay, I want 2,500 paper sales and 5,000 Kindle and 1,000 EPUB. That's what I came up with <laughs> as a target at the start of the year. And this was my starting point. This was the, at the end of uh, December, December 30, 31st. So I knew what my increase had to be. So I did my best marketing, selling, and then at the end of the quarter, I came up with, with this result. And it is typical for OKRs to, be, to have a quarterly cadence. So every time you give yourself targets for the next, for the next quarter. 
Well, uh, 1,940 books sold in, of the paper version, that was a 60% increase of this to that, right? So 60% of that distance covered, nah, okay, okay. Uh, Kindle sales, not that good. I was clearly too optimistic about what I could sell myself on, on Amazon. And then EPUB, my God, what a disaster. Are there any EPUB uh, readers here? Anyone using EPUB? Do you get them from Pirate Bay or something? <laughs> Just kidding, because I'm not selling anything, apparently. apparently. So, uh, but, uh, but this is interesting. This was a learning for me. And then you take the average and then your score of these percentages is 33%. Not that good. Now, how are OKRs different from KPIs, Key Performance Indicators? Well, first of all, you give those targets to yourself. Right? There's no manager giving targets to other people. If you do that, you're doing OKRs wrong. Okay? You give yourself targets, like an athlete tries to run a certain number of kilometers per week or something like that. Maybe with a coach who says, well, I think you can do this or that. The second very important thing is no bonuses attached to those percentages because this is learning that we do. We measure our own progress, but uh, we don't want to have specific numbers there. Actually, Google, where this practice came from, or they borrowed it from, from Intel actually, but Google made it famous. Google says the sweet spot is 70%. If you have a 70% score, then probably it was hard, but not too hard. Because if you have a 100% score, then it was too easy. Next time, aim higher. Set yourself higher goals. If you stretch to 70%, then probably it was hard, but not too hard. Now imagine what happens if a manager says, you get a bonus uh, of this amount of euros if you achieve 70%. What is going to happen with the targets that people set for themselves? Right? <laughs> That's how it works. <laughs> we all know how that works. So, no, that is not allowed. And uh, I, do, I do that with my team. I did that with my team several iterations. We found it very difficult because it's very hard to come up with the metrics uh, that, that are good representations of objectives, etc. And uh, it is also very hard, we know this, if you're still in startup mode uh, because then things change too fast then even the cadence of every quarter is just too fast. After two weeks, you already notice, oh, the metric doesn't make any sense anymore. We now realize we need something else. And then, well, you have to wait for two and a half months for the next cadence. So in startup mode, I noticed it didn't really work, work well. But I like the philosophy uh, uh, behind it. And many people use OKRs quite successfully if they're not in startup mode, I think. Uh, what I did experiment with on one of my teams was uh, is, to, uh, is to not only have uh, the, the positive targets, like this is what we want to achieve, but also the negative targets. I really hope that we don't end up there, because if you have a, a, a good one and a bad one, you can plot where you are along a line. And I did that with several metrics, and then, ta-da, a wonderful spreadsheet. I love spreadsheets, but I'm addicted to spreadsheets. And then you can turn the cells into red ones and green ones. And oh, I got so excited. And I even turned it into a plot. <laughs> I had my progress metric, <laughs> my scoreboard of the team. And we did that for 10 or 20 weeks or so. And then I gave up because it was just too much work. But there was some value in, in, in measuring. And as I said, it is still a practice that I'm struggling with. We're now doing it simpler. We have. With my current team, Agility Skills, we have one North Star metric, as we call it. There's one thing that we measure every week and several leading indicators that lead up to that. And we do measure every week to see if the metrics go up. That is definitely something we keep. And probably we're going back to OKRs maybe in a year or two when our business has stabilized, when we don't change direction like every, every month or so. So... A bit of a break in, in, in between. I, uh, I introduced the Agile practices uh, a long time ago at the company where I worked. As I said, I was CIO uh, and it was pretty successful. I, I managed to do all kind of practices, inviting people to my house for dinner and, and cooking with them and, and 
putting up a bell and the showing vacation photos to each other during lunchtime and all those silly things. But also introduce scrum practices and they form self-organizing teams, all that stuff. And it worked well. It worked actually, it worked so well that turnover in the company dropped from 17% to zero. Nobody wanted to leave anymore. I was so proud of that. Because in the rest of the company, turnover was still high. <laughs> but not in IT, which what was, what was my domain. People were happy there. Now, there's a chicken and egg question. Um, is it that these successful practices made people happy? Or is it happy people who usually introduce successful practices? Or is it a bit of both? Hmm. I will let you vote. You can raise your hand only once, okay? I know German people are honest, um, usually. So, only once. How many of you think that usually it is good practices leading to happiness in the organization? Let me see some hands. Usually, the good practices leading to happiness. Okay. 17.2% of the audience. Okay. How many of you think the opposite? That is usually the happy people who introduce good practices in the organization. Okay, 82.7%. I'm really good at this. I'm really good at this. So, uh, yeah, so it is a bit of both. The, the most researchers agree with the majority of this audience. Uh, as Sean Aker said, he wrote The Happiness Advantage, a really nice book. He said, uh, we know that happiness is the precursor to success, not, not merely the result. He acknowledges it also goes in the other direction, but it is not just uh, the result. But Phil Rosenzweig said, he wrote The Halo Effect, I gave it also five stars. He said, does employee satisfaction lead to high performance? Probably, but the reverse effect is stronger, performing leading to satisfaction. Difficult, but he called it satisfaction, not happiness, which many researchers say is more or less the same thing, but some don't agree. Difficult topic. It is quite complex, actually. A fact is, and this has been confirmed time and time again, despite all this complexity, happy workers do and achieve more. That's a fact. That's, that's sometimes 12%, sometimes 17%. There's different percentages, but there is a difference that it makes sense to have a happy workplace because you can get more done with, with everyone. So I once researched this. I was at a, I remember I was in, in, in Buenos Aires at that time in Argentina. Fascinating country. Nothing works. Everyone is happy. <laughs> it's amazing. It's amazing. Yeah. You land in Buenos Aires at the airport, all the cash machines are broken and they all have different error messages. <laughs> all 12 are broken in a different way. It's amazing. It's amazing. Uh, but they don't care because they have great food and they, and they dance the tango, etc. And they're smiling, so okay. Um, so I was, uh, I was somewhere in the marina area uh, sipping a cocktail. I probably paid for it by reselling the air conditioning of my hotel room. I don't remember. Um, and um, I did a bit of meta research. What is it that the researchers say that make us happy? Because there's plenty of research there. But uh, I, I looked at the patterns across all those articles. And this is, this is what I found. What makes people happy is uh, thanking someone every now and then and be appreciative. Um, give something to another person. Help someone out who is in need of assistance. Eat healthy, healthy foods, make those available. Exercise, work out regularly. Um, rest well, sleep sufficiently. Experience new things, run experiments. Hike outdoors, enjoy nature, the fresh air. Meditate, mindfulness practices. Uh, socialize, hang out with other people, um, aim for a goal in life and in your work, and finally smile whenever you can, even when you have to fake it. <laughs> That's what some researchers say. Amy Cuddy has a famous TED talk. She says your body posture, the way you stand, the way your facial muscles uh, are, are placed in your face, basically they influence your thinking. So if you don't really feel powerful, just have a powerful position. Uh, uh, body posture. If you don't feel happy, just paint that smile on your face. <laughs> and 
and your, your face will trick your brain in believing that you're happier and you will be happier. It's amazing. It's amazing. I love science. So this is basically a checklist for, for, for managers and leaders. You have to contribute somehow to these things because this, this helps people be happier. For example, I know companies with meditation rooms. I was at uh, Zalando in Berlin just a couple of weeks ago. They're moving to a new office because that company is growing so big, so fast. And they have actual meditation and prayer rooms on every floor. That's amazing. Um, I, I know companies with kudo boxes where people give each other thank you notes, written, handwritten thank you notes. And then the person who receives the thank you note, they get a little present from the company, like a box of chocolate or, or something like that. Just small things, but people love giving each other presents that, that way. Um, I once took, my, took our software teams outside in the sun for some code reviews. They thought it was really weird. They thought it was weird. I, I basically I had to drag them from their caves outside into the fresh air. They were like, oh my god, what is that bright thing up there? And I said, that's the sun. That's the sun, you idiot. They'd never seen it before. They'd never seen it. And I said, sit over there on that tree trunk. I had printed some classes and interfaces. Yes, I know what I'm talking about. I'm a software engineer, duh. And I uh, said, so, okay, we're going to review this stuff. And, and they love that. They actually like going outside. I called it hiking. <laughs> <laughs> it was only 100 meters, maybe less, but it was quite a long way for, for, for some of them. And stretching the definition a little bit. So, uh, so yeah, there's, there's things you can do as an organization to get people be happier in, 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 in the company. Uh, I know people who exercise together. Uh, my partner in Brussels says that they have their weekly run with the whole office and even people from other embassies are joining and they're now running with 50 people once per week on Wednesday afternoon. That's awesome. And it's all emerged uh, spontaneously. Uh, having healthy foods available, etc., etc. Plenty you can do. So go to this URL, download the poster and show it to your manager. Says, this needs to be done. This is our, this is our checklist. Okay? Couple more examples. I have uh, 19 minutes to go. All right, that's, I'm going. It's going well here. This is uh, oh, this is a favorite of uh, of some people. So uh, <clears throat> so we now have people doing work. They make progress. They're happy along the way. Now every now and then, some people need to be rewarded. Maybe everyone needs to be rewarded. Or are there high performers versus low performers? Ooh, dangerous topic dangerous topic. So uh, the traditional approach to this is that um, at the end of the year we, we, have, we have a basic income for everyone, basic uh, salary, and then by the end of the year some people get a lot more. And the managers decide who that is, right? And then traditionally uh, the, uh, the uh, Pareto principle or Zipf's law or the 80-20 rule is used, uh, applied, which means 80% disappears in the pocket of the CEO and then 20% goes to the next hierarchical level. And this repeats itself on every hierarchical level until by the time you get to the bottom, nothing is left, right? They call that trickle-down economics, right? So many people say, well, that's not very fair. We need another way to, to motivate them or, or, or reward the performers. Well, some people say, oh, I don't really like that. Paying people money is not the best motivator. Why not pay everyone the same? Just pay everyone. It's just, just steady income, no silly bonuses. Just give everyone the same amount. Oh, well, it's very nice. It's very nice, very uh, social suggestion, um, uh, except that it doesn't work. Did you know that? Um, on average, 70% of drivers think they are above average drivers. Makes no sense. Makes no sense. They measured, on average, 80% of college professors think they are above average college professors. Now, these are smart people by definition. <laughs> they should understand the whole idea of average and 50%, assuming a normal distribution, right? I am convinced that among professional keynote speakers, 95% think they are above average. I know these people. So what we should not use is how people think of themselves. Because <laughs> mo most people 
think they score above average. What, what happens when you pay everyone a steady income without differentiating who the performers are, the overperformers and underperformers, then on average 70 or 80 percent of the people will think they are underpaid because they don't see any signal that, that, that is correlated with their performance. Right? And then they will be demotivated. So you will demotivate 70 or 80 percent of the people with a flat a structure like that. I have something else with my team, with my Happy Melly team, uh, that we call merit money or peer to be a bonus system. Every now and then we have a little bit extra, not much, but enough to send a signal. So it is not enough to fight over, it's not enough to go cheating or whatever, but enough to send a signal so, signal so that people know where they stand. And uh, it, uh, it works like this. At the start of the month, every person on the team has 100 points and they are required to give those points to others. You can't keep the points for yourself. So 15 points to you for helping me out yesterday, uh, 10 points to you for your super fast response time, and no idea how you do that, 20 points to you for so rescuing the web server after I crashed it, I'm so sorry, thanks for helping me out. And so people give each other uh, rewards for, for tiny things, helping each other out, often the, the, the intangible social things on, on the team. And these, these, these points build up over time. Now what also builds up over time is the bonus money. Because depending on how well the company is doing, we set aside some bonus money. Depending on the profits of the whole organization. It's like a jackpot that grows and grows and grows. The only thing that we need to do is pick a moment to convert that the points that people earn from each other into the money that is available. This is how we do that. So we have a simple company rule. At the start of the month, one person throws a dice and it has to be on video, otherwise it doesn't count. If that person throws a six, we pay out the bonus money. No six, no bonus, that's it. <laughs> the bonus is still there, you can try again next month. Right now. It's, like a, it's like a jackpot. And the points, they, they, they don't vanish, they, they keep rolling over, so the money is there. You just have to roll a six until you get it. And the whole point of this unpredictability is when you promise a bonus in December, most people will already have spent the money before they even received it. Right? And then it is often less than they expected, and then they are demotivated again. <laughs> you can never do it right. <laughs> But our team cannot do that. They can't spend it because they don't know when it comes. It could take a year rolling the six. <laughs> and they think this is their own little Las Vegas casino that they have every month. <laughs> every time, oh, we're going to roll, we're going to roll the dice. Woo and it makes them all very, uh, very excited. So simple practice, uh, add some playfulness as you can, as you can see, and the team, and the team uh, loves it. Of course, I get many questions around, about this practice around the world. Jürgen, isn't this, isn't this, this, this working for the extroverts better than for the introverts? Well, we've actually researched this and we could not find correlation over two years of data on the team with the extroverts and introverts that we had. Maybe on other companies, but in our company we didn't see a correlation. Um, does it, uh, doesn't it lead to uh, uh, people uh, uh, be trying to be popular and getting, uh, doing things for each other just for the, uh, just for the, uh, just for the, the ass kissing effect basically? Uh, well, uh, maybe, maybe not. But what you have with the traditional bonus system, you already have that, right? It is, it is, it is, uh, it is already ass kissing effect with, with the manager you have. Only in this case, with merit money, it is democratized ass kissing. <laughs> the team has to kiss a lot of asses all, all month long, I can tell you, in order to get a bit of bonus money from each other. You have to basically please everyone. Oh, isn't that a great idea on a team? <laughs> <laughs> to make sure that everyone uh, is, uh, n thinks you are a great, a great team member. 
so uh, no, the team is quite happy, happy with it. But there's only one person who didn't like it, and, and we fired her. <laughs> Easy enough. So <laughs> next, uh, next topic. Two more. Ten minutes left. All right. so, um, so we have a team making progress, and every now and then they get a little bit of extra. That you can buy a pair of shoes, basically, with the bonus money. It's not that much, but they, they like the practice. And, uh, and now every now and then there are hard decisions to make. There are sometimes there's these tough decisions that we have to make together. Uh, I'll start with a little bit with a, with a test. Does anyone know from which company I stole this screenshot? What we stand for are our values, uh, responsibility and sustainability. Which company is this? Volkswagen. Very good. Right. Responsibility and sustainability. Uh-huh. We Dutch people, we think that this is a rare case of German humor that we see here. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, well, I probably don't have to explain what happened with Volkswagen. They just paid a billion uh, penalty or something like that recently, right? So let's not go over that. Uh, Volkswagen is not the only one. There are others even worse than that. Enron destroyed itself with crookery and thievery, etc. And they had corporate values as well. <laughs> we value openness and honesty and respect. They were thieves. <laughs> they were thieves with nice looking values on posters. So it didn't mean anything. But it is important to have values that you live up to. And uh, that is the problem in many organizations. The espoused values are not the enacted values, as the researchers say, because they like difficult words. And we have to make sure that that distance is closed, that gap gets smaller between what we say, what we do, versus what we actually do as a company. Well, there are some examples what you, uh, how you can achieve that. Some companies have culture books, culture codes, they are sometimes uh, called. One of the first in the world was Zappos. They're famous for a lovely looking culture book with quotes and pictures and, and stories and, and everything. They were acquired by Amazon a couple of years ago. But many more out there, uh, IDEO and Netflix, and, and, and they were among the first. But now you, if you look on SlideShare and you type culture code, you find thousands of these codes. And maybe some of them are fake. Maybe some of them are like Enron, could be. But others are true companies trying to express what they, uh, 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 what they stand for. So document what your values are, but then it's not, it should not stop there with the documentation. You actually have to live those values. You need to have something where you check what your stories are. And one practice that I found in this book, Reinventing Organizations by Frederic Laloux, he said, uh, some companies get today to have annual value days where everyone is invited to revisit the purpose, values, and how they live up to them. Right? Are we doing what it says on our website? Are we really being sustainable? Are we not uh, cheating somewhere? Right? Are we really being honest and, and etc. that what we claim to be? You can check with actual stories of stuff that is going on. There's one thing, one problem here, this happens only once per year. That's not often enough. You have to do this much more regularly to share those stories with each other. Now this is a quote that was uh, retweeted thousands of times a couple of years ago. The culture of any organization is shaped by the worst behavior the leader is willing to tolerate. Think Uber, for example. Right? Not a good culture that they had. They had to replace, they had to kick out the CEO and, and, and have a new one to recover. Uh, well, everything that, uh, uh, that, that went wrong. So many people will recognize this. If, if you do not intervene when something bad is happening and you do not intervene as a manager, then that is the baseline of your culture and everything else will grow from that. I prefer the positively phrased version. The culture of any organization shaped by the best behavior the leader is willing to amplify. Sadly, this did not get thousands of retweets. Still waiting. I'll take a picture. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go ahead. And one more try. Okay. So uh, probably you need a bit of both, right? Sometimes you need to intervene, but more often I hope you are 
shining the spotlight on the good stuff that is happening in the company, giving compliments and, 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 and rewarding and applauding the, the great things that are hap happening. So what uh, one, of, uh, one of our teams, the Happy Melody team has, they have a value stories channel, for example. They share the stories of how, we, how the team tries to live up to the, to the values and they do it on a regular basis. That uh, a bonus system that I mentioned is actually a tool that we use, Bonusly, and it allows the team actually to give each other compliments with, by mentioning the values, patience, boldness, uh, flexibility, so we can actually, we make those values measurable even in the compliments that people give, uh, give each other. And uh, this is, this is the, the normal part of, uh, of that uh, team, you could, uh, you could say. Uh, the others are too weird to show. Um, <laughs> and uh, after a bit of uh, retro uh, reflection and introspection, we came up with Dare to be Bold, Always Be Kind and Make It Creative as the three values of that, of that team. But still, I cannot remember them. But I remember the stories because people are great storytellers. We love telling each other stories of what we did last time when we had a difficult situation on the team and how we handled it. We don't memorize lists, bullet points, but we remember the stories. So make sure you share stories with your team. Last example, then I'm going to shut up because I have about five more minutes left. So um, should we celebrate failure or should we celebrate success? Did you know there are fail conferences in the world where people get together just to celebrate failure? Woohoo, I wasted one million euros. Celebrate. How many of you think that, yeah, every now and then it is okay to celebrate failure? We we'll ring the bell for celebrating failure. That's fine. Okay, let me see some hands. It's okay to ring the bell when we failed. Okay, decent number of hands. Some too scared to raise their hands, perhaps. Okay. How many of you say, well, that's okay, maybe, but I prefer to ring the bell when we have successes? Okay. How many of you would prefer still to ring the bell for successes? Okay, most of the people. How many of you say, well, let's just ring the bell all the time. Failure, success, doesn't matter. Party, party, right? <laughs> Makes no sense at all, right? So uh, here's the real deal. I based this diagram on a book by Donald Reinerson. He wrote a very complicated book, The Principles of Product Development Flow. Forget it, you won't understand it. I understood only half of it and then I gave up but I turned the idea into this diagram. And Donald said, we have good practices because they usually work. Right? That's why we call them good practices. Sometimes the good practices fail. It happens every now and then. We have mistakes or bad practices, but I prefer to call them mistakes because we don't do them intentionally usually. Uh, and they usually lead to failures. That's why we call them mistakes. But sometimes mistakes are actually beneficial. They work uh, in rare instances, like when somebody mm, uh, did something stupid and then uh, something, uh, a new invention emerged from that. Like the pacemaker was invented because somebody inserted a resistor the wrong way around in a device and things like that. And yay, it's interesting. But it doesn't happen that often. Experiments are in the middle and uh, experiments should lead to 50% uh, failure, 50% uh, success. And that is where learning is optimal, Donald Reinerton says. That's the whole point of calling them experiments. Uh, that's what, what we want to find out. Does this work or not? And learning is optimal when that percentage of succeeding, failing is 50-50. Is so we don't learn when we run good practices. Uh, we don't learn when we repeat mistakes. We just confirm that we're idiots. Um, but we learn something when a good practice fails. Aha, so this particular Scrum or Kanban or Agile practice does not work in this situation. How interesting. We learn from that. Uh, example, I'm, just, I'm not making this up. I got an email a couple of, uh, a couple of no, it's a, a year ago already or something. Someone from Eastern Europe said, Jürgen, we tried the bell and our company didn't work. How is that possible? How, how can a, a bell not work? It's amazing. So the email continued, well, it, it worked for a time and we celebrated, but then one of the software developers rang the bell for celebrating that he had had great sex the night before. <laughs> I'm not making this up. And the email continued and after that, nobody wanted to ring the bell anymore. <laughs> nobody could top it with even better sex, apparently. 
So the practice stopped working. So, oh, fascinating, I learned something. <laughs> Good practices fail when somebody uses it for a stupid reason. <laughs> so uh, an example over there. So mistakes sometimes succeed, as I gave you some, uh, uh, an example. So celebrate failure is this part of the diagram. That makes no sense. That makes no sense, because why would you celebrate being an idiot, just repeating the same mistake? There's no reason to ring the bell for that. It is good to celebrate uh, uh, successes, but the problem with many organizations is that they only celebrate successes. And then you incentivize people to move in that direction, right? to, to repeat good practices. But we also need people to learn, and that requires experimentation, which is in the middle. Uh, that is what this part of the diagram is about. Yes, we need good practices, but we also need, uh, which sometimes we have mistakes, but we also need experiments in the, in the middle. A bit, of, a bit of both. So by all means, we have to, oops, we have to, <laughs> I'm ready, I'm also ready. We have to repeat, we have to celebrate successes, but we also have to celebrate learning. Ring the bell when we learn something, even in the cases when we failed. So we'll call the celebration grid. Uh, some people use it successfully at the end of workshops or, or uh, at the end of retrospectives and uh, uh, I, uh, I find that a very useful practice indeed. So these are the seven silver bullets. Hopefully you saw the themes over uh, across my stories all the way from managing the system up to building for, uh, for meaning and uh, you can all find all of that in this book if you, uh, if you like uh, or sign up for my next book project which is this one. Uh, it will appear in April 2019. Startup, scale up, screw up. My publisher is still difficulty with the title, but uh, it's going to emerge somehow uh, next year. And if you're interested, just sign up and I will keep you posted. Thank you so much for listening.